this Eureka uh, webinar in association with Maxon. My name is Paul Fanning and I'm editor of Eureka magazine. Um, today's presentation is entitled The Magic of the Islanders DC Motor Winding and will be presented by Matthew Dean, medical sales engineer at Maxon. Uh, before I hand over uh, to Matthew, I would just take you through a few things. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and we'll either attempt to answer them at the end, or if we don't have time for that, we will hand them on to Maxon and they will answer them for you offline. Uh, that's about it. Uh, I will now hand over to Matthew. Matthew, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, talk through the key points of the ironless winding in regards to DC motors. Um, some of you might have... Uh, heard phrases like uh, cordless motors or ironless motors, um, but what does it actually mean? Um, and that's what I'm covering on this webinar. First of all, I'd just like to introduce you briefly to Maxon. Um, Maxon, we, we are a, uh, a manufacturer of cordless motors or the ironless winding motors, brushed, brushless motors as well, um, Swiss-based, we have about 3,000 employees worldwide, and we produce roughly 5 million motors a year. And we have all the uh, technology competences you would expect from a motor manufacturer, um, winding technology, gearbox manufacturing, encoder and sensor technology, drive electronics, molding, automation, system integration, and mechatronics. So that, in a nutshell, is Maxon. So let's go back to the very start, um, the history of the DC motor. So we have to go back to 1825 when an Englishman called William Sturgeon discovered electromagnetism. Um, seven years later, he turned his idea um, into a motor and he was the founding father of the DC motor. And in 1832, he, he claims to invent, uh, invented the DC motor. And we have to remember at this time that this was the sort of Victorian era, the great era of steam. So the DC motor was competing against yeah, steam engines um, and such forth. And so not huge um, amounts of usage uh, of DC motors was, was done during the uh, uh, Victorian era. It was mainly treated as just a scientific experiment, really. Um, it wasn't until 1886, uh, when Mr. F uh, Sprague refined the idea and made an actual motor that would generate enough power to be useful. Um, and very early applications of, of this type of motor were things like hotel lifts. Um, one interesting thing uh, I found is that a very early land speed record was actually held by an electric car at uh, the amazing speed of 18 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that was sort of like the Victorian era. It wasn't until we got into the 1930s that the ironless winding was um, perfected. And in 1970, Maxon patented uh, the manufacturing process of the ironless rotor with the diamond shaped winding. So we could say that the ironless winding has been around for maybe a hundred years. So now we're gonna look inside a typical brushed DC motor. So what we're looking at here is the rotor. So this is the moving part inside uh, the brushed motor. There's a couple of key components um, that I've labeled here. You've got the copper winding wire, you've got the iron laminations, which make the kind of skeleton um, that the winding wire is wrapped around. You've got the commutator um, at the back of the rotor, uh, where the brushes run, and you've got the motor shaft running through um, the whole assembly, and it's the motor shaft that transmits the power into whatever it is that you want to drive. Uh, the little picture you can see on the left there is what a typical motor lamination looks like. So the iron, um, the laminations, um, or iron laminations, are, are made out of very thin um, sheets which are pressed 
um, or cut out of thin sheets and stacked on top of each other. Um, so it's not one solid lump of, uh, of iron, it's actually very thin sheets that are pressed together. And we'll come on to why that is a little bit later. So if you look at the typical motor construction, so now we're looking at everything, the rotor, uh, the magnets, um, the motor case, and the end cap, um, this is typically what you would find. Uh, these, this motor type of construction covers probably 95% of all brushed motors um, made, and they are made in vast numbers, mainly in Asia. Uh, many, many millions a year of this type of motor are made. Typically on, an, on, a, on a car, you have 50 of these, um, positioning seats, uh, wing mirrors, making your windows go up and down, whatever. Um, so this is by far the most typical way um, a motor is made. So now we come on to the ironless winding. Um, so we've seen how most motors are made, 95%. Now we're looking at the 5%. So if we look at the picture on the right here, this is what the rotor looks like in an ironless motor. So a few components I can point out here. One is the, um, the copper winding uh, that is fitted to the motor shaft through a carrier um, assembly on the back of the winding, and you've got the commutator and shaft. So the, the big difference, what you'll notice here is the iron laminations are missing. They're, no, they're not used in this type of motor. The picture on the left actually shows you the path of the wire uh, within the coil. And this was um, the winding process that Maxon patented in 1970. So let's, let's compare the two types of uh, rotors, because this really is fundamental to understanding what the difference is. So on the left, we've got the traditional iron core rotor, and on the right, the ironless rotor winding. So a couple of key points here. The iron core rotor is much heavier for a given size. Um, basically, it's a big lump of iron laminations with some winding wire wrapped around it. Um, because it is so much heavier, the rotor has much, much higher inertia. Um, another key point is the outer diameter of the rotor is not continuous. What you'll see is that you have ga gaps or slots between um, the sort of petals of the, of, of the laminations. And this is why the motor cogs um, on, in the traditional iron core rotor. And also on the ironless rotor, where we've taken away all the iron, we now have a big space right in the middle of the rotor. Um, and that's where the magnet lives. But I'll show you that in a minute. So this now is the, the construction of the ironless winding um, brushed DC motor. So if you look at numbers four, five, six, and seven on the right, that's the rotor that we've just been talking about. Um, item number two is the magnet. And what you'll notice is the magnet now lives right in the heart of the motor case rather than around the outside, which is where it traditionally lives on the iron core motor. So the, we've now moved the magnet into the space with inside the rotor. Um, the housing and the brushes, the shaft and the commutator are very similar. It's, it's, where we, it's what we've done with the magnet um, that is, a, is a, a big difference. So what's the point? Why would you do that? Um, the ironless winding is, is much more difficult, um, complex and costly to manufacture. So, so what's the point? The key here is that you've reduced the mass and inertia of the motor rotor. What that does for you is that when you ask the motor to do something, instead of having what can be described as a, like a flywheel, a big, a big flywheel inside the motor, 
Um, it, it no longer has that. So when you ask the motor to do something, it immediately does it. It's far more responsive and dynamic, and it has a low mechanical time constant. That means that when you ask it to go from speed A to speed B, it does it much, much quicker than um, the iron core motor. Also, higher power density. Um, as we've moved the magnet from the outside Around the, around the edge of the case to the heart of the motor. Um, we get far more out of the magnet for a given size. And also because the manufacturing process is far more precise, there is a much smaller air gap between the coil and the magnet in the motor. Because there is a smaller air gap, uh, the motor has a much higher power density. So you get more out of a motor for a given size. Zero cogging. So what I mean by that is that because we haven't got the iron laminations with the slots um, between them, the motor has zero cogging. If you held the motor in one hand and the shaft in the other and you turned it by hand, you would, you would find very little resistance to you turning the motor shaft, just the friction in the bearings. With, the, with a motor with, with cogging, what you'll feel is a lumpiness as it goes between the poles of the magnet. Um, this has a big benefit if you reduce the cogging or take it out completely, uh, it, you end up with a motor which is far more um, useful when looking to do some accurate positioning. So the motor is no longer fighting positions that it wants to sit at, it's happy to sit at any position through 360 degrees. Another big benefit is you have no iron core losses. You've taken the iron out the motor. Um, so the motor can be said to be far more efficient and a more efficient motor um, results in a high power density. Lower weight for a given size or for a given power. Also lower noise, both electrical and audible. You no longer have a great lump of iron rotating um, within the motor, the typical motor speeds could be 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 RPM. So if you're rotating big lumps of iron at that sort of speed, you're going to have vibration and that results in noise. Lower EMC um, and longer brush life. As you no longer have uh, copper, the winding wrapped around uh, the iron laminations, you have a much lower inductance of the coil and because you have lower inductance uh, you have much less arcing in the brushes and much less um, emc noise so that's five or six points of why um, of the benefits of removing the iron from the motor rotor is there a downside well unfortunately there is a downside um, right at the top of the list here is the cost to manufacture. It's much more difficult and much more costly to make an iron, make the ironless rotor. That's the big downside. A few smaller points to mention here. As the coil has lower inductance, you might need to add some chokes in the drive circuit because the coil and the motor rotor will react pretty much instantly to any um, fluctuations coming from the drive. So at maximum, we would ask for higher P PWM frequencies to be used when driving the motor. Another downside is as the winding or the, the, the copper winding is, is, is not wound around a big lump of iron, uh, the coil can heat up much more quickly. It doesn't have the iron around it to act as a big, a big heat sink. So you have to be careful uh, when driving these motors because they're much, they're, they're, you get more out of them, but they're less forgiving in terms of um, reacting to current and, and the heat in the coil. I mean, a typical thermal time constant for a 10 mil diameter motor is around four seconds. So you have about 20 seconds before the temperature of the coil is at its, um, is at the maximum temperature. Whereas with a 
an iron core motor, you have much longer as it takes much, as it heats up much more slowly. That's the downside. What I'd like to do now is just give you a quick overview of, of a typical application where really the ironless winding is, is the perfect motor technology for an application. The application I've, I've picked is a, a prosthetic hand. A um, number of reasons why I picked this. Firstly, is we have a space constraint. Um, the size of a prosthetic hand is the size of a human hand. You can't change that. So having motors with a high power density is absolutely critical because you're very, very limited on space. And you've got to think within a prosthetic hand, there could be at least four or five brushed motors doing various movements of the fingers and maybe the wrist as well. Also weight, the lowest weight possible for a given power. Again, it's tied in with a point just made about power density. A prosthetic hand lives at the end of someone's arm. Um, the muscle supporting the arm are in the, in the shoulder and in the, um, the bicep area. If you have a very heavy hand on the end of your arm, you, you, your arm acts as a big lever and the weight, you really feel it in the shoulder. So for the user of a prosthetic hand, having the hand as light as possible is a big benefit. Dynamic response. Um, this is, again, comes back to the inertia of the motor rotor. That when the electronics, um, when, when your brain decides that it wants to move a finger, that tells the electronics in the hand to move, and then the electronics tell the motor to move. If there was a delay in the motor responding to what it's being told to do, and that delay is caused by the, uh, the mass of the motor rotor, the user would see a momentarily a momentary delay in the finger doing what they want, uh, which just yeah is not acceptable uh, from a user uh, viewpoint. The other key point here is the efficiency of the motor um, with a higher uh, higher efficiency because we don't have the iron losses. The batteries last longer. All prosthetic hands are driven by uh, batteries, and we all know about life of batteries. So this slide is called dynamic response to control. And what I'm trying to do here is explain to you um, what the effects are of having a dynamic motor. So let's just take uh, a typical human. We have a cognitive response time of between 150, 200 milliseconds. That's your brain working out what it wants to move. It sends signals by your nerves to your muscles, and then your muscles move and your fingers or your arm moves. Uh, so you've got 150 to 200 milliseconds to do that. Um, if within a, in a prosthetic hand, we add some additional time uh, in order to actually start the, the, the movement of the finger, uh, as we accelerate this lump of iron in the motor rotor, the user would, would, would see their fingers reacting very slowly to what their brain is telling the fingers to do. And that must be, uh, yeah, just not acceptable. Feedback devices fitted to the motor shaft will tell the drive electronics the speed and the position of the motor. Uh, and from a control viewpoint, if, you, if the controller is telling the motor to go from A to B and the motor very rapidly can go from A to B, uh, then the control loop will be far more responsive. Um, if th the motor is struggling to do it um, because there's huge delays in it accelerating and decelerating itself, the control side would have to be very, very um, soft, softly tuned, and, and the user would see delays in the fingers actually doing what they were, what they were asked to do. Um, another big, uh, a big um, attraction here is the zero cogging effect of the ironless winding. The rotor can be positioned and controlled through 360 degrees. You imagine you want to move your finger from A to B, but when it when your finger gets to B, the motor decides, no, I'm not going to stop at B. I'm going to I'm going to move on a little bit 
because that's uh, the effect of the cogging um, from within inside the motor. The control side would have to constantly fight it. Um, and again, from a battery power consumption and a control side, it just would it just wouldn't work. So in summary, the, uh, the magic of the ionless winding, the benefits that it brings you right at the top, low inertia of the rotor. We've taken out the iron, the great lump of iron within the motor. Uh, we have a very high power density, small air gaps because the motor is very precisely made um, and the magnet can live right in the heart of the motor. Lower weight for a given power. So you might want 10 watts of power. You might save a few hundred grams on the weight of the motor that's capable of delivering that power. Zero cogging, so for positioning, um, the ironless winding is, has, is, is a major benefit over uh, a rotor with the iron laminations in it. Low noise, both audio, audible and electrical. Audible noise, you haven't got this great lump of iron rotating at 10,000 or 15,000 RPM, causing vibrations um, in the system. And also electrically, uh, because the inductance is lower, it's far kinder on the brushes, um, which are connected to the commutator. So the, you get longer brush life. Higher efficiency, there are no iron losses um, within the rotor. So that in a summary is, is the sort of key points that this webinar uh, and this presentation um, is what I'm trying to get across. So a quick overview of, of uh, Maxon's products. Um, Maxon has a, has a comprehensive catalog um, you'll, you'll find in there lots of, we call them standard components, but they're catalog components, motors, gearboxes, controllers, encoders, etc. But most of what we do falls into the semi-customized product or the fully customized product. And this is um, where Maxon is making a dedicated power transmission product uh, dedicated to an application. Final slide here today my contact details. So if you want to talk in more detail, um, contact me with any questions regarding ironless windings or, or motor applications. Uh, feel, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt, um, uh, that, for, for an excellent presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions, got time for a couple of questions here. Um, so I'll get straight into them. One of them is, uh, how small can you make the winding? Okay, well, that's a good, good question. So at Maxon, we have a motor, um, the smallest diameter brushed motor is four mil um, OD. So that's the outer diameter of the motor case. So the winding um, outer diameter would be somewhere around about three mil um, in diameter. So it's, you know, these, these, these windings are made under, under the microscope because yeah, these things are very, very, very small. About three, about about three mil, Paul. Okay. Uh, and the other question is, uh, how hot can the windings get? Okay. So the limitations um, on the winding uh, temperature um, is usually down to the stability of the coil, which comes from the various coatings which are uh, which are on there. But our, our highest ambient temperature that a brushed DC motor would work in is about 200 degrees. So the coil will actually go a little bit hotter than that. Um, but an ambient temperature of about 200 degrees, uh, mainly used in the oil and gas industry, um, okay. is the sort of temperature we're, we're looking at. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have sent in a question that hasn't been asked, um, we will be passing that on to Maxon and they will uh, be able to answer it offline for you. Um, and with that, it really just remains for me to say thank you very much to Matthew and thank you very much uh, to you for joining us.
Thank you very much.